You are now tapped into the coolest reptile podcast in the world. Welcome to the Trap Talk Reptile Podcast. Boy, do we have one for the books. Who sold their DGs? Raise your hand. Nope, not me. Dave Levison. Here he is. Got my boy, of course, my right hand. Okay, I like it. You're feeling good today, buddy. Feeling good. Feel good. I find that newer breeders are freaking out. Breeders that have been around for a couple of decades aren't even thinking twice about it. That's my take on it. I'm in the not thinking twice about it. Justin, how much are you selling that DG for, man? Let's be honest. How much are you selling it for? <laughs> I'm not selling. I'm buying. It surprised me because I always tend to, uh, I think, overestimate how smart people are. <laughs> but I, you know, when, when Ben came to us and said, hey, these are the results we have from your animals, all the tests we've done. We'll show you the exact same chart in a little bit that he showed me. Right. I was blown away, of course, and surprised. And I, then I thought, you know, really, it doesn't really change anything. It's just new information, new way of looking at it. Let's, let's dive in, you know. And I thought, we're going to tell everybody, and everybody's going to be super excited about it, and that'll be the end of it. I was not anticipating what happened yesterday, and I should know better. I really should know better by now. <laughs> what do you, what do you have to, what do you, you're going, no, go ahead, Justin. No, I was like, I think I understood, I thought I understood it really well. I thought I understood all the details of it. And then just reading all the comments yesterday, at the end of the day, I was like, I got to watch um, RGI's podcast again because all these comments have confused me so much. But yeah, <laughs> it's fun stuff. What do you have to say about that, Summer? Yeah, I mean, I think we knew a little bit ahead of time that this was, you know, the case just because we had been dealing with the results we've been getting. And so I think maybe we had a little bit more time to process it. So it wasn't as, it felt like everybody was reacting a lot stronger than I guess I expected. But it's it's great that, you know, just see people engage and interested. And, you know, I just hope that we can um, calm the the landscape a little bit. I, I, I don't think it's as um, earth shattering as maybe people think it is. Um, although it's really, really interesting. And I'm excited to see, you know, what else is discovered about it. Yeah, interesting. Definitely not boring right now. I think this is all awesome. When they were looking at one gene, it wasn't 100%. And that was kind of where the issue was, you know, where in the issue lies, right? So, um, but now the tests that they're doing are actually testing for both of those mutations. So they can actually tell you not only with 100% accuracy, whether or not it's het DG a, they can also tell you if it's DGB. Now, the part that is still up in the air re is, re is in regards to that DGC, um, which is this like unknown mutation that we still don't have the location for, but is theorized that it's kind of the key to why some animals that are heterozygous for DGA and heterozygous for DGB sometimes appear visual. Um, and while other times they don't. I only kind of watched the video. I'll admit it. I watched half of it. So this is where it gets interesting. As far as the research has shown so far, there are no visuals that aren't at least head A and head B. That being said, the chances of producing non-visuals from an actual visual is really slim. Um, but there have been re anecdotal reports of it. And I think as we continue to move forward with testing more animals, we'll be able to see when we test the parents and test the babies, what the actual results are there. But as of now, yes, I think there is a slight possibility, but I don't think it's something to be overly concerned about because we've been operating under the assumption that all of this works like simple genetics for the past two decades. And for the most part, everybody's been fine. Does that make sense? Uh, oh, I guess one reason I bring it up too is, you know, there's been a lot of collections that have had DGs just randomly pop up and random pairings. That's something that I've dealt with a lot with Ben's collection. Um, I guess my question is, is it, I'm just happy to run into heads on both sides or am I running a head on one side and then the polygene that's making it almost look or look like a desert ghost? That could very well be. Um, again, I think the, the trouble is just not really having that, I, that, that third gene identified yet. I think that's really going to answer all these questions that people have. But yeah, I mean, that very well could be the case because anecdotally people have had, have had clutches where they produce animals that didn't look DG. Um, but because they thought they had to be, they thought, well, maybe it's low expression or maybe it's been dual sired or had retained sperm. And then likewise, DGs, you know, have, like you're saying, have popped up from pairings that maybe they shouldn't have. Um, and then also there's this idea that every now and then people get these DGs that are just, lower quality and maybe that has something to do with that third gene. Free DG to DG, you get DG. 
but it's the what level of DG, correct? There Somewhat. seems to be some, some level of there of whether or not this homozygous for A and B or heterozygous for A and B, or what, you know, if there is a C or D or those may have a factor. It seems like all those play a role in how good the animal looks. And again, if you were to get go a, a visual to visual clutch, you might get some that are really low expression because not all those genes are hitting on them, but you'd still call them DGs. You'd still assume they're DGs because you're working under that simple recessive assumption. Right. Several times a year, I've had I've had a clutch around like, eesh. In fact, Summer and I were just before the podcast, we we're just going over some pictures from a couple of DG to DG clutches where there's one animal that like, it's not just a head, but man, it doesn't look as good as the rest. I mean, think about when normals were the only jam we could work with, right? Whoa, Dave, what is that? Whoa, Dave, what is that? Whoa, Dave, what is that? Can you please? Uh, it's a dog. It's a dog. It's a dog, buddy. We're back. The thing is, is that with ball python breeding, there's a little bit, or, or maybe even a lot of holding back the best looking animals. But if you're, if you're just doing that, I think you're going to find yourself pretty far behind in this industry in the sense of it's more about what additional genes it has that, that causes you to hold them back. And so, yeah, I'd like to hold back the most, the best looking regular desert ghost in the world, but I'm not going to hold that one back over the one that has four other incomplete dominants in it. I do think that that sort of environment where you are keeping the best looking animals year after year after year, what you're doing is you are, I think, to an extent, within a good collection, you've aggregated a lot of the desert ghosts that are homozygous for A and B after, over time because you're keeping the best looking ones. I think all this is going to do is just give us more information to work with moving forward. Um, I mean, I, I hear a lot of people being worried about kind of what Dave was mentioning, like having bought hets that are actually not going to have the right hets to line up with other hets that they buy that don't have the, the like interlocking hets, right? Um, and, and I mean, I understand that concern. My feeling is that it's a little bit premature to be worried about it, considering that we don't understand how that third gene plays into it and whether or not that actually is going to affect like the validity of the heads, right? So I, I would say it's a little too soon to be freaking out about anything. Um, and I'm just more excited to keep learning. How is this polygene do you think is going to work? Is this going to be similar to other species where you could literally lion breed your desert ghost to look better? Great question. Like I keep brettles pythons, right? And we have like a hypo, which is a poly polygenetic line bred kind of morph in a way. Um, but th I think the difference here is that this seems to be, although polygenic, like a very simple polygenic where really it's these two mutations that are really the vast majority of whether or not an animal presents as DG, um, as opposed to other mutations that could have thousands of genes that are playing like into whether or not something expresses and how expressive it is. So because of that, I don't know how much line breeding is going to be um, a factor. I think in general, I think the more that you do that with anything, kind of like we were saying, you know, there's always going to be better looking versions of anything, whether it's a normal or a Mojave or whatever. And I think it's interesting, like you're saying how some facets of the industry, like the concept of like a polygenic trait is like old news, right? But this is really the first time the ball python world, I guess, is having to deal with it. Um, and so it's kind of like, wow, but you know, like you're saying in other species, there's tons of polygenic traits that people have been working with for years. And it's just a, a fact of life there. I think it's possible that some of these genes are responsible for why some desert ghosts tend to be more yellow and maybe why some of them would tend to be more gray as adults. Like some of the original ones from nerd and the bells I remember were extremely like, like nice, nice like steel gray as an, as an adult. And I don't see, I see some of them getting that way still, but not so much anymore in my collection. So I think there's some probably aspects to there to make one, one version look different than another a little bit of the variation there if that makes sense could it have anything to do with the cryptic gene because i thought some of the early dgs were throwing cryptic stuff could be picking up on that gene right now but they don't have a test for it yet don't think so personally i don't see any connection yeah, there I'm not seeing the anything. reason that i would say no is that we know that cryptic is allelic with clown right and they yeah. do have a test for clown so while they don't have the mutation for cryptic I would think it would be on that same, I don't really know how the tests work like in that regard, but I would think if they're looking at that area of the gene, then they would be able to see the spike of the, the PCR test. Because it's on the same allele as the clone. Right, exactly. So 
And that would have an exact spike or just a very similar spike on the chart? That is a Benson moral question. Right. <laughs> Who reads, <laughs> reads the test. Okay, so this might be really tiny, guys, um, and I apologize if it is, but this is where you, this is kind of our spreadsheet that we go back and forth with rare genetics on. So this is like full disclosure here. This is all of our, all of our results. And then over on the side, you can see we have all these notes where like things that maybe were questionable or didn't really make sense. We've kind of gone back and forth and discussed with people or with Ben, like giving him more information, followed up on things. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can see the results here. We have all of these animals on this spreadsheet. We've tested 78. Um, some of them were controls just to make sure that we weren't getting flags um, when we shouldn't be. And then, yeah, you can see here was what we visually had identified the animal as and then the actual genetic makeup. So this kind of goes to show how an animal like this line right here, 13, could be het het and not visually represent. But then another animal right here could be het het and visually represent as DG. And so getting those results multiple times is what kind of clued Ben into the idea that there's gotta be a third gene at play here because, um, that would be the only explanation for why sometimes these snakes are showing visually that they're desert ghosts and other times they're not. Yeah, so you have snakes that are they're identically on A and B, identical snakes, and some are visual DG, and the same the same identical genetic on A and B will sometimes just be a well, a, a non-visual. And so there's something else that is triggering it to be visual or not with exactly the same genetic makeup in the animal mm -hmm. right and what's go ahead summer i was just gonna say um what's interesting to note is you know the more that we get this data which is which is why it's so interesting and why there's just still so much learning to be done is that like you know now i'm starting to go back on the spreadsheet and look at not just the parents but look at the grandparents and see if i can kind of try to deduce like whether or not this animal would have been possible for it to be like a homozygous animal or heterozygous for both and see if that is playing a role in what the visual outcome is. Um, like here, you can see that these th two are both het hets that didn't visually represent. They're from het to het pairings or a het to visual pairing. And then these are also from a het to a visual pairing. So there's gotta be something else that that third gene, I think that we're not accounting for that's, that's playing a role into whether or not they're presenting as visual DG. Can I share a concern? Yeah. Um, like this is all informative, right? Uh, but you know, you got to admit that even people who are really tapped into this kind of stuff has, have to sit and think about this. So you can only imagine the new person coming in, looking at this like, holy <laughs> crap. Um, and, and we don't want to scare those people off, obviously, right? But in more simpler terms, um, my concern is like someone, you know, okay, the, the someone out there saying, well, you know what, if this is the case. I feel like my DG is this and I'm going to price it at this. And I know that that person's DG is not as good as look, looking as mine. So that doesn't make sense, right? That could be a pain in the ass or excuse I, me French. Well, I think it's all hypothetical. And I think I see it as in terms of like the, the pro, my, me personally, I think I see it as a positive in the sense that it's going to enable people to put a, put a higher value on animals that have a higher value because they have, more genetic potential to produce more visual offspring and yes it might i mean it's going to require like you you know it could like maybe price people out or something but that's the case with anything in the ball python industry really i mean there's going to be a certain point where you get to a level where you have to have the right level of investment in order to to take part at that level they should always look and see what other people are in the market and you know when they're trying to price that's what we do it to, we do it as well you know we we always try we can't just be pie in the sky we think well what do other people have similar animals for and we'll work off that from that basis here's the reality is we've had genetic testing now on a lot of the common genes for about a year approximately clown pied and we've still seen that most people aren't going through that process on animals they're going to sell. Um, we've seen most people who, who go through the process of getting the test done for, from what I've seen, what I've talked to only on their personal animals that it makes a personal difference to them if it proves that or not, like their holdbacks. Um, and so I just don't see that, that this being even more complicated is going to have a rush of people running out there 
to say, I'm not going to sell my DGs until I get them tested when they won't even test a 66% head clown half the time. So with everybody running around with fear about the price coming down, wouldn't it be the opposite if it makes it, I mean, harder to do anything, especially when you get to that point of the hobby where you're going for triple head to triple head with DG on both sides on the head? If people don't test, it shouldn't change anything. If people yeah. do test, theoretically, they could make some of their animals um, more valuable or less valuable based on what the tests show. But I think the vast majority of this hobby will settle into, hey, this has been working for us and we're going to keep doing it this way. But firstly, for anything I keep back, I'm going to pick the one that has the highest genetics. I'm going to actually test them. I'm going to do this. Um, and I'll test anything that is high enough end that the customer is really going to care. But, you know, desert ghosts are not that expensive anymore. That's that's the reality of their amazing mutation and their um for relatively base genes simpler stuff they're very affordable um and i just don't think a lot of people would would say that the customers at that level care to know exactly where their uh their dgs hits on the on the testing scale i want to step back for a little bit no disrespect you guys want to see some magic hey buddy mark how's it going good how are you how's georgia i'm just kind of hearing about all this and i i you know i um i've been doing dg for i look back on my records i the first clutches of dg i did were in 2013 i think i you know that gene has been in existence i i want to say since the early 2000s um is that does that sound about right john carlson said he discovered it in california around like 93 or 96 and then he sold it to the bells oh uh, yeah carlson? john carlson said that he undiscovered that animal in california i did not even know that i'm good friends with john i'll i'll, I'll talk to him about that but I, I remember seeing that snake, that the, the desert ghost on the Bell's table in um, Daytona. I think it was at the one of the first shows at the, uh, what's that place called? The Ocean Center. Um, and so it's it's been around a while. Um, I, I've never bred desert ghost to desert ghost. And I've never heard of anybody breeding desert ghost to desert ghost that have said that they have found a non-desert ghost in that clutch. Um, and but you're suspecting that you have. It, mm -hmm. Is that what you you, you think? You yeah, have? we've certainly we've certainly seen a few every year that only in retrospect. Again, only in retrospect. Mm -hmm. And we were just we just pinpoint one earlier this evening that although. I, I wouldn't, in retrospect, say it was very Desert Ghost. It's a great looking animal, but not on the level of if it hatched out of a different clutch, I'd be like, oh, that's a Desert Ghost. Now, was that in combo with something else or was that just plain Desert yeah. Ghost? That's the challenge of it is we don't, you know, everything is so comboed up that it's hard to compare apples to apples. See, when we, when, we were first, when, when we were first doing Desert Ghost and all my production was head to head, actually, um, I... I always ended up waiting until all my stuff hatches by August. And then I, I would all with those, I would always end up waiting until the spring because I couldn't tell what they were as babies. I'd, I'd wait until the spring to sell them. Um, and I always ended up with very high percentage of desert ghost out of those. And there, there were some that were just like off the charts and some that were, you know, so, so now, those were just straight desert ghosts. Um, I still have a couple of animals from those clutches and they've, they've produced what they should when I've bred other hats to them, but I've made, you know, I've used other stuff. I haven't used those to make desert goat. So it's, it's, you know, from my, from what I'm seeing, I've always, I've always thought desert ghost was different. There was something going on there for, first of all, I see a color and a pattern mutation there. So I don't know where, where these you know, it gets complicated. I don't know where the color and, you know, are there separate pattern genes? I, I don't know. Um, have, do we know that? I've not seen the pattern. I've not seen the pattern so much, but I definitely um, have seen different color variations. Again, some of them are more gray. Some of them stay more, turn yeah. more gray. Some of them are more yellow. Um, mm -hmm. And again, they may be part of this, this uh, polygenic thing we're finding out about now. Yeah, and I think I think there's as far as the desert ghost stuff, I think it it basically works the way we think it does. I don't think it's going to change much um, right. as far as the market goes. I I find 
you know, just from from watching the the little video from what was his name, Benson? Yeah. Is that okay? Um, Benson. I find this just that this is this is cool stuff. <laughs> um, you know, we're you know, yeah, you could you could probably get so, some genetic testing done and make some more money um, that way. It, it, it's interesting to me because it's not so much about the money now. It's just, you know, this is stuff I've been looking at for years. And now it kind of make what what I saw and what he was saying, it kind of makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, what what I'm seeing with Desert Ghost in combination, I don't quite see it to the extent that I did in just normal Desert Ghost and Pastel Desert Ghost. I can speak to what I see within with what I do. You know, I I'm not I, I didn't see that breeding. I didn't see that clutch. So well, I don't I guess simply genetically how we're saying we could breed visual to visual and still make normal looking animals. Could you do visual to visual and get a whole clutch of normals? Could according to what Benson according better? to what Benson is saying, no. No, no? you you, okay. you he, according to what he's saying, you could make um from a visual desert ghost to a visual desert ghost, you could make uh, a non-desert ghost animal. Can I say something about that? Because I'm confused. Um, okay. And that, that's what I'm saying, MJ, is that I don't mean to cut you off, but yeah. the, the gene has been around forever. And I, I've i never heard of anybody not producing a desert ghost from a DG to a DG. You know, so I don't think it, it – and, and Benson even says it's not a the, – the odds are very low. A friend of mine once bred a Xanthic to a spider had Xanthic. He got nine eggs, no Xanthics, one spider. Next year, he did the same pairing, nine eggs, finally hit one Xanthic animal out of 18 eggs with visual to hex. So if you have visual on both sides and there's that low percentage chance that the genes would work in a way to make a normal-looking animal – could you have odds so good on that shitty thing that you can make six normal looking animals if you hit it just right? Not impossible. Odds can odds can do crazy things. Yeah. We all we all know that. It talks about the DG thing. It it sounds like well we need to test every DG that's out that's in existence to to be able to tell. Well, that's a lot of testing. So I you, you start to look at that yeah. aspect of it. Um, I I think for the new guy coming in, the existing people here. I don't think it's gonna. I'm, I'm with Dave. I don't think it's gonna change much. I, Justin, I, 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 you know, I, I, agree. I agree with you guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think to us, I, you know, I mean, I, I haven't done one, sent one shed skin in for, you know, I got a box of like fifty or sixty shed skins sitting over there. I just never sent them in. Um, it's just kind of where I'm at. But, I, you know, I think it's very interesting, and I think this guy can can. Uh, uh, you know, a, a geneticist like this can help us with a lot of things. I think we have other genes that are poly, polygenic. Mm. You know, I was talking to Ozzy today. Um, Ozzy called me about this. Uh, and I, I, I said, you know, I think Orange Dream could be polygenic. And he said, you, I think so, too. <laughs> uh, he and I have been working with Orange Dream as long. You know, he was the originator, and I actually got the original animals that he had from him a few years after he bred them so it, you know we're seeing some of the same stuff the high intensity first orange dream i produced were i mean they were you you couldn't tell they were orange dream yeah i um, mean you know, i think i'm going to go back to the same thing i said about allelic when we learned what allelic meant in this part of the industry we've now discovered a lot of animals that are allelic so you talking about early pastels maybe a little more lime bread you know even justin saying you could bring a bunch of animals that are normal, put them on a table, and some are just so much better than the other. You want to believe that they could be, but it could just be a lime bred, nicer looking animal, even if it's out of the wild. A few moments later. So, by the way, am I in a delay or are the things I'm saying just not registering? Because every time I say something, you guys all just go like dead in your face. You got to lay it out. You're, out so, right you're so deep that you're so deep that we're like, oh man. Is it too much? Is it? Because I'll tone it. I'll tone it down. You know, I'm gonna go back to that, that, that whole "I'm not gonna talk" thing. I'm all about it. <laughs> this uh, episode is brought to you by Mark Bailey over at Mark Bailey Reptiles. Mark, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your night, and uh, yeah, we'll be talking real soon, real soon, my man. Thank you so Thanks, much, man. Mark. Peace right, out. Guys. Later. Bye. I like Mark Bailey. You know, it's what it's something he said in one of the podcasts you did with him earlier that uh, actually really helped me with my breeding just a few years ago. So yeah, talking about his feeding, his feeding schedule after uh, a female lays and before she uh, 
restart breeding her again. I, I found it very helpful. So Can we kind of talk numbers? Props to Mark. Talk about someone out there who's really coming in here with the financial plan. Every dime they spend matters. Start out doing it for themselves on their animals that they want to keep. Right. Gives them the knowledge going forward. Um, I think that's the biggest bang for your buck. And I think as most people who are doing shit testing right now are doing that, which makes sense. Um, I think there's a certain level, and I don't know if there's an equation you can give that would make sense to to shed test a snake you're going to sell, right? right? You have to ask yourself, you know, what's the upside if it proves to be, you know, outside of DG, if it just proves to be het clown or het hypo or whatever the gene you're testing for, is that upside worth the $65 or is it just easier? What I found personally, and I have shed tested probably over 900 different animals now. Um, 10, 10 to 15 times what anyone else in the industry has done, I'm told. Um, I found that shed testing makes a lot of sense, um, even when the animal doesn't prove. And I'll explain, I'll explain a little bit why. There's a lot of customers, um, when they see an animal in the market and they see it's possible head for something, that's a turnoff to them because they, they probably don't want it. They think, they think, oh, the price must be inflated because it's possible head for this. And I don't want that gene. I don't care if it's 66% of clown. Most people have their projects they work on and it actually narrows your customer base when it's possible head for another project. And so I found that um, when I shed test a snake, you know, I used to shed test a whole clutch and I'll say, well, theoretically on the average, half of them would prove they'll be 100% het, they'll be a little bit more expensive. But aside from that, they'll also sell faster because there's a certain amount of people who really want that het. And now you've provided an animal that actually has that het. And for the ones that don't prove, you could take the possible head off it and they sell faster as well. They may sell for a shade less, but you don't have it on the market for a month, four months, which is also time is also money. So I found that shed testing across the board is extremely useful. That's with a certain high end. I don't shed test animals. I'm obviously going to give to the pet store, right? But there's a certain level at which that makes sense. Everybody needs to find that for themselves. Yeah. I find that makes sense on both sides of the equation, both when they prove and when they don't prove. It's a little bit inevitable, but I hope that we're able to present the information as it comes and people will start to absorb it. But I mean, I understand that it's a little bit complex and I mean, it's a little bit complex for me too. I just try to wrap my brain around it as much as I can. Again, like if nothing else, you know, the more information, the better. And I just think the more that we can learn about the stuff, you know, because we've all been kind of just going, doing all this very blindly and, and in a very rudimentary way for so long, just by trial and error, right? But to actually have like real data behind what we're doing is really cool for the first time, really. I'm gonna be just looking at stuff that may be quote unquote enhancer and taking all the other non-enhancer enhancer stuff and making that available. I, I'll tell you, I've never been a line guy. Um, to me, lineage um, is important when when you are selectively breeding for the specific version of something that you want. And we are just there is just hundreds here of of genes to add and to combine and everything. That lineage is uh, uh, you're talking about a fraction of a percentage of a difference potentially between some of these lineages, if there is any. Right. That is, you could, you could get a, a thousand percent change just by adding one incomplete dominant. So I'm going the incomplete dominant route. Right. So I'm not big on lineages. Um, I have enhancers. I have a lot of enhancers and they're beautiful, but the enhancers I have have three, four, five genes in them. Sometimes they have incomplete dominance in the, in the desert ghosts I have that are pure desert ghosts. They have a bunch of incomplete dominance and they're gorgeous. And honestly, I, 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 I never almost I never have an, an enhancer in a, in a DG side by side. Um, I just want to make the, the prettiest things I can across the board. Um, and we've mixed them a little bit, but we, we do, we do try to like make sure we designate, right? If this is pure enhancer, we, we keep calling it enhancer. We still call our bananas, bananas and our coral glows, coral glows. That makes no sense. Want, <laughs> but I, I get it. I, but we're not going to change the name. Whatever it came to me as, it remains that way. Because that's not my job to, like, say, to start swapping names around. If I, if I buy an acid, it's an acid. If I buy a static, it's a static. Because we have some animals that tested het het that are visual desert ghosts. And we have others that tested homozygous homozygous that are visual desert ghosts. So I've kind of I've, I've put some albums together if, we, if, 
it's okay if I just throw some of these up and people can be the judge as to whether they can see a difference. So this is het het, right? So this is a, a het DGA, het DGB animal. And this is in particular, a, I don't know, because the ID is not on the file, but that, fire spot yeah. nose. I'd say it's ghost. not the best quality desert ghost, in my opinion. All right. Now here's another one. Fire red stripe That's DG. Better, I'd say. This is pretty clean. Um, Firefly. It's got so much other stuff in it. Yeah. yeah. Firefly DGG stripe. So these are all head uh, head. These are all head head. Fire spot nose okay. DGG stripe. Leopard DG. So that's it. I say it's a poor quality leopard DG. Mm -hmm. uh, fire leopard leopard DG. Yeah. And finally, fire spot nose DG. So those yeah. are our hat. hat. Fire makes them look better. That's the challenge. Is fire is such a nice enhancing more mutation that's going to make right. any DG pop. But I would say all those to me are not the best. Average Except, best. I mean, this average one, but it's best. got pastel in there and fire as well. So yeah, there's so much there. Yeah. All right. So then let's take a look at the homozygous homozygous, which theoretically maybe if this has anything to do with the way how how strong the expression is. What does homozygous mean? I'm sorry. What does homozygous really mean? Okay. So you have uh, every trait, every gene, you have two copies of it, right? You get one from your mom, one from your dad. If you have one copy of the mutation, you're heterozygous. So you will, only one of your parents passed down that mutation. If both of your parents passed down the mutation, you're homozygous. So homo is two, het is one. Hmm. So this one is um, red stripe yellow belly, DTG stripe clown. There's a man in, a man in Canada who's going to be happy with that snake. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is the one you were telling me about. Yeah. No, no, it's not the one we're telling you about. It's a different one. Oh. But yeah, this is, this is also in Canada. This is a nice snake. So yeah, homozygous, homozygous. Okay, so that's theoretically might be a better quality looking animal. Right. Um, this one is our yeah. heavy hitter. And this is an amazing snake. No, that one's not heavy hitter. That one's the son of the heavy hitter. That oh, one, it is. That one recently went somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, you're that right. You're right. Best, that was one of the best quality DG clowns we ever made, though. And you sold it? And we did sell it. Because we have, well, yeah. How much? How much? We had another similar. How much? Uh, Come on. Good money. Good money. God, and, uh, but that was, the, that was the best of the best. And at the time we sold that, we had no idea that DGA and DGB existed, right? So there was no testing about that. So. Yeah, so it's okay. a super incredible animal. All what right. Then it? we have this animal. Ooh, I like that. Is that DG at all? Well, we have not identified no. it as DG, okay. but it's homozygous, homozygous. But it must be missing the DGC then. That's, that's what I'm not, saying. That's, not, that's yeah. not a visual DG, not in a visual or sense. Not enough that we would think it is. Yeah. So that's where I'm right. thinking the DG, the C is coming into play. Interesting. It still looks great this, for a hat, right? Right. Yeah. This is a red stripe spot nose desert ghost clown, possible red stripe. Okay. Here is a black pastel yellow belly lace desert ghost head clown. Now that snake as an as older it looks insanely nice. It's, oh I bet. Yeah. This is a kind of not that great looking red stripe desert ghost. DG, yeah. Yeah. Average. Average. This is one that's See. also pretty average, yeah. So that's the one, that's one of the ones I was talking about earlier. This one came from homozygous or from a visual desert ghost to a visual desert ghost. And this one does not look visual desert ghost to me. Wow. Um, even though it's it tested as homozygous A and homozygous B, that is a fire spot nose, um, fire leopard spot nose. And it came from desert ghost to desert ghost pairing. And that to me does not look like a desert ghost of any significant quality, if, if, if at all. Um, I would say it looks like a fire leopard spot nose. That's a little bit brighter than normal. But mm -hmm. so that it should, again, you're seeing this variation here, which we always just said this variation, not quality, not quality, quality, not quality. But now we actually have some actual metrics with the RGI to not only, I think, um, measure it, um, but also maybe to re refine it with specific metrics going forward. Yeah. Um, last, this is DG G stripe. Mm. and red stripe dg so interesting this is this is probably a better looking red stripe mm -hmm. dg than this one 
I would oh, say. Huge difference. Huge difference. But they're both homozygous, homozygous. So this could be a case where, again, that C gene is coming into play. Maybe. There's these two genes that seem to account for the majority of the expression of DG, but there's these inconsistencies that they found that things just don't line up, which is why, um, you know, the theory is that there's a third gene that also ties into the, whether or not it expresses. That's why this is so much confusion around this. If we understood um, what DGC was and how it worked, this would all be much more simple, just straight, just straightforward. Right. right now, it's like there's, there's this nebulous thing out there. It's like the, it's like the uh, Kennedy uh, assassination. It's like, well, there's this guy on the knoll, and maybe you know, what I'm saying all this good going on that it makes it really, really hard to actually see a clear picture of what's going. If you don't know this information, it's just floating out there, and that's what we have right now. And it, just okay. look at those pictures. We have some of the best quality desert ghosts I've ever made and some of that I would say are average quality at best or barely um, even look DG yeah and they and and as far as we can measure they're exactly the same amount of DG mm -hmm. but there's just there's other factors out there that we just can't right. quantify and they may be very important at this point Justin how many codons are you looking at that you don't want into DG there's no codons that do poorly with DG at all they're all amazing. It's been about, what, 48 hours since this information been released? Maybe a little bit more, you would say, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, how many cells have you had to save? <laughs> <laughs> as much as what's happening on the genetic side, what do you guys think about what's happening right now with Morph Market? It was maybe the right day, didn't they? Something's happening with Morph Market? <laughs> oh, Summer. <laughs> I'll send you the memes when we're done. That's the biggest question. The market decides these things more than we do. All we can do is, is provide some suggestions. You know, even when like we try to name a new combo, like right. either the market loves it and, or, or I never hear that word again after I, after I name it one or the other, you know, I don't decide, but, but I think it's going to be, we, we honestly can't do too much until we figure out the, the rest of it, the rest of the equation. I'm going to call. I just got a phone call from, can you hear, can you hear us, Jacob? Yeah, I can hear you guys good. All right. So what, what would be your question for tonight, Jacob? Anything you have regarding this Desert Ghost uh, topic? So my question is, um, if you have a male that's homozygous for both A and B and a female that's the same and you pair them and, you know, she lays eggs, they have babies. Do we know if those babies are going to be also homozygous AB or is it going to be a combination of the four? And if it's a combination of the four, do we know if it's going to be like a percentage based thing? Like we see with like head animals to visuals and head to head. Yeah, no, it, yes. it should pass on just like any other heritable trait. So, I mean, if, if you, if the mother's homozygous again, so think about it like a double recessive. If, if you have a, a DG clown, double recessive, homozygous, homozygous, bred to another DG clown, homozygous, homozygous, you're going to get all DG clowns. Homozygous, homozygous. No, I, right, but are you going to get a combination of the four? Because there's like four different combos that can produce a, vi a visual DG. Are they going to all be homozygous A and B, or is there going to be some that are homozygous A and head B? So again, if, if the parents are homozygous A and homozygous B, both of them, all the babies will also be homozygous A and homozygous B. Right, because like there's, they showed the chart. There's like four ways you can get an actual yeah. visual desert ghost. So and if you did heterozygous A and B... To a heterozygous A and B, so then you could have all four combinations. Homozygous A B, or if they're going to actually, you could end up with a, a double het A B. Does that make sense? No, 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 no. Okay, yeah. So again, I think you're you're. It is complicated, but it isn't that complicated because it, it it's still it's still just you have you get two copies of a gene, right? One from your mom and one from your dad. If your mom is double A A and your dad is double BB, the only options that, and they're both AA and BB, the only thing that they can give you is A and B, right? So you're gonna get A from your dad, A from your mom, and you're gonna get B from your dad and B from your mom. There is nothing else, there's no other option. They would all be homozygous, they would all be homozygous in both categories, cool. Uh, hey Jacob, thanks for calling in, man. Obviously uh, I appreciate you uh, being a part of this and uh, enjoy the rest of your night. Civil Serpents on Instagram, guys, give him a follow. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks for having me, guys. Cool. Prediction is that it's going to be mostly the same for most breeders. And then some breeders who are really, um, really up on their stuff and really, really want to figure it out are going to start shed testing more. But I just, I just think that the vast majority of people, it's not going to trickle down that far. It would matter a lot more if it's a brand new project and 
you know, visuals were $20,000 each and people had to buy hats, then people would be testing those hats like crazy to make sure they got the right hats to the, you know, to make, you know, it, it'd be really important. But now we can skip that stage. We buy visuals for what, 500 bucks at the most, two, 300 bucks for, for a visual desert ghost male, I would assume. So you can get a whole, you can get a whole range of amazing visual desert ghosts under, under a grand. I know that. Um, that being the case, I just don't see why people are out there. I spend a lot of time testing, um, when you can just start with visuals, run a collection full of visuals, um, long-term. Yeah. <laughs> Going back from, you know, today for right now, um, Tuesdays on my Instagram live and Monday, just, um, a couple of things is one, we're still going to have some people that's confused about this, uh, the project and how it works and things like that. And that's fine. Um, I'm just happy that now we have um, a better way to kind of, you know, explain to people intelligently about what's going on as best as we can. Um, but my only knock on Ben from um, the last couple of lives, and uh, I'm sure he'll talk about it more on uh, this podcast this week too, is that when he started seeing that the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, like the, the A and the B samples, I asked him, I said, um, what percentage of A's vices, what percentage of B's were there? Was it a 50-50 split or 60-40? And he said, uh, looking at it, that he didn't see a big gap between the two to try to uh, quanti qualify, quantify which one was more than the other. And that's where I kind of was like, yeah, I think you should have been keeping track of that, bro. <laughs> you know, so we could know, you know, if there's going to be from those samples, is there a more viable, is, are there more like prevalent A's on average or B's? Or at least have the information out there so we can kind of make the determination that whether that's going to represent in everybody else's collection or that's just going to be anecdotal from the stuff that he has. So that was only my well, really, that's only my big What do you see, Summer, on, on our spreadsheets at 50 50? I'm trying to pull it back up right now. Um, yeah, I I'm mean, curious I too, think, Antoine. Let's see. Um, it, it we can keep seems talking really, it. it seems really even. It doesn't. Yeah, it's not. That's my feeling. It's not was looking that like even. obviously that one is more than the other. Okay, and um, um there's a lot of comments in uh earlier on in the um in the live that uh someone said that they've determined that enhancer and bell line is the same thing, and he has not. So I try to get him to admit that, but he said with the information he has, it's tested similar, but he is not determined the same way. Like, you know, there's two different, like there's candy and toffee and things like that. So he has not come to the conclusion that the enhancer line and the bell line is the exact same thing. So, so yeah. unless I'm wrong, he told you guys that, am I correct by saying that? No, we, we've, we've sent in plenty, a lot of samples for enhancer, pure mm -hmm. enhancers of the end and DGs. Right. And as far as a and B go, there's no difference between they them. both express but a and b the, is right difference might be in the other you know mm -hmm. parts of it and so it's early to say i think do you have sahara justin no okay because um i, I know um, mike from insane said he had a mix so he said it is compatible and he said he had a sahara slash dg and he had sahara by itself and of the three he believes that that's the inferior line of the three so i just mm -hmm. wonder if anybody else messed with it no not yet wasn't there also like the? I mean, I think he just decided to abandon the name, but didn't Bob Vu have like the Phoenix that well, ended up being compatible? It, and then he just started calling Desert it, Ghost. It wasn't so much that he had a Phoenix, it was yes, he had his DGs and his stuff. We used to talk about this like seven, eight years ago. Um, you know, the argument in the industry has always been that the co dominant desert has messed up the recessive DG project, they look very similar to each other, and a lot of people coming in have always been very confused. Right. So his argument is, man, we have this amazing gene and the name is what's bringing it down. And that's why I feel like you hear more DG being said over Desert Ghost when it comes to marketing that project, because the name was hurting the project. We've had it forever. It took a rebranding or just something new and fresh to happen to make people want it. Well, that's why I did get into it right away, because I was confused about how it was working or if people were saying desert and hypo or what you know so it just wasn't really clear at the time when it came out um it's funny you mentioned desert too because i said earlier i said people are pretending like we had the same revelation with desert ghosts as we had with the desert gene you know and yeah. Yeah. that effect that affected me more than i think anybody else i know because at the time when like the ball street journal posts were coming out and you came out with your experiment with that and 
because I didn't really see it in a lot of the forms and people were just selling me desert female combos like crazy. And I was like, man, I'm, a, I'm killing it right now. <laughs> and you know, that was a big majority of my collection when I had to pretty much sell everything for pennies on a dollar and start over. So it definitely is not that. So, and that right there is probably the most extreme example as we had with finding out about genetics later. So, um, I just want to reiterate the guys is man, it's it's not that big of a deal. Like if you're seeing these infinitesimal stats about people doing a visual to visual and then making like one okay looking baby or one that just eh, is on the cusp of looking desert goes and it took five shares for it to look kind of nice, then it's not that it's not that much of a panic, man. Like stop stop tearing up your betting slips now and just kind of keep going on and doing what you're doing. We've had a, we've had a handful of our animals that were not connected to the DG project at all. Um, get as part of the panel test show that they have DGA and or DGB um, oh, on this man. last run. Um, again, not connected to DG at all, but it'd be interesting to take one of those animals that tested to have those genes and run it to a DG and see what happens. Thank you guys are awesome. I'm, I'm enjoying the podcast and stuff, man. So you guys keep trucking, man. I appreciate you guys coming on and helping decode all this stuff. And um, I'll keep watching. Talk to you guys soon, Justin. See you, Dave. See, see you, you See, My goal is that we i mean i don't want everybody to burn i don't think the desert ghost project needs to get burned to the ground or anything like that but i i think ultimately i hope that people do keep talking about it in the sense that the more that we talk about it the more people learn and start to understand this stuff right kind of like again like dave was mentioning like allelic stuff like that kind of got thrown into the ball python industry people had to kind of wrap their heads around it a lot of people still have trouble wrapping their heads around it but the more that we just keep on reiterating it and presenting it in different ways and showing how it all works. And especially with this, again, we're just, we really only have a piece of the pie. We don't have the full picture yet. Once we have the full picture, it'll be easier to actually explain because um, all of these lingering questions that people have that kind of make it seem all mysterious and weird and conspiratorial. Um, once we have answers for those, I think it's just going to be easier to explain and for people to digest. I mean, before I fucking took in the phone calls, we were well over 300 people. Uh, so I apologize for, for, uh, almost damaging that, but not really. I'm just kidding. It was a joke. I mean, I had a good time tonight. Um, start this with summer, summer people love you. You're, you're, you're a hit in the hobby. Um, thank you so much for being on this side of, uh, controlling the chats and being very uh, interactive. But what would you say to everyone out there rooting for you, rooting for Canova clutch? everything that you love in this industry. What do you have to say to everyone? Yeah, well, I would just say, first of all, thanks everybody for tuning in. It's been great to get to talk about this more. I'm excited to keep talking about this, excited to keep discovering uh, whatever there is to discover about this gene and then other genes down the line. And hopefully Canova and Clutch can be, um, you know, a, a part of sharing that information and helping to make sense of it all um, so that, you know, we can help keep the hobby progressing and moving forward and, you know, take it to new heights. So yeah, appreciate you guys. It's been a blast. And thanks MJ for having me on. Thank you guys. Give it up for summer, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Bye summer. You rock. Talk to you soon. Mm. And there was three. Oh, Justin talked about some drama. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it doesn't take much for a lot of people to, to find out about neglect and people are reasonably upset about it. Um, yeah. As, as was I. Um, any per any sane person who views neglect of an animal, if they have a heart, it it just breaks for the helpless um, animal that has no choice in this matter, right? Um, having said that, I think I think that we have these lynch mobs too, and and I'm I'm not I'm not necessarily I don't think that's the right the right tactic. You can you can uh, expose it. I absolutely agree with exposing. Um, and at the same time, like there's a point where we just kind of revel in the, uh, in the pain that we, we can, we can inflict in this moment. Um, so I'm, I'm on, on the fence about it, right in the middle of that. Partly too, I think you have to blow it up to an extent. And because there are just so many people who are casual in this industry who would never hear about it. And then we continue to patronize the same person over and over if you, if it wasn't blown up past a certain level, Right. At one point when everybody who knows, you know, who, who's on the inside knows, but that's not really good enough because most of these really, really big offenders are selling to the general public who don't have any kind of um, eye for what's going on in our industry. So, yeah, yeah, I feel a lot of ways about it. None of them are, none of them are positive towards, uh, towards people, these abusers. It's, it's, it's the most horrible thing, you know.
it's probably a good thing that this DJ thing's happening because we could just focus on this bit of uh, exciting stress. Not that it's stress, but it's curious. Yeah. You know, it's exciting. This is uh, so, some some stuff that's being talked about. But uh, I know you're hanging out with family. You're 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 doing your thing. I appreciate you taking the time, Justin, to sit down here with me and my buddy Dave and bringing Summer along. Uh, but what would you have to say to all your supporters out there, man? I appreciate you guys. I just love doing what I do. I'm a lucky man. And, um, and uh, I, I, I get to do it and I get to share all this with the wonderful community. It's nothing better in this world. All right, so. man. Well, have a good night, guys. Give it up for Justin from Canova, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Later, buddy. Then we're going to have to talk about the clap. Like, I don't I, like that clap? Like, I, Is I, it not I, loud enough? It's almost like I didn't like Justin tonight. I'm just going to put my hand up. What does that mean, man? That's a polite ass golfer's clap. You clapped. You clapped for summer, and then you gave Justin a hand. Well, that was a high five, and he left me hanging. Yeah, you're one of a kind, buddy. Thank you so much. I, I mean, let's let's hear it from you. Uh, what's the conclusion for tonight's episode? What do you think overall? I think overall we should probably adopt um, hepatitis over het. I think we should hold back our Pamela Andersons, but don't forget your Tommy Lees are going to do just fine. They might not look great, bud, but they bring a lot to the table when it comes time to breed. Enjoy the rest of your nights. Thank you so much for being a part of this, and it's a wrap for my boy, Dave Levison. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up. You hear that clap? That's so respectful. Later, buddy. All right, guys, thank you so much. Why don't you hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and then drop a comment. I really want to get some feedback from you guys. Guys, episode 352 is is in the books for exclusive content you guys already know where to go man if you want to get some un unreleased content behind the scene type footage you're going to want to go down to the very first link below join the trap talk patreon family as soon as you join the patreon family you get a link to the discord tapping with all the trappers man have a good night thank you everyone and i'll see you guys next time here on the trap talk reptile podcast